Good evening and welcome to the Einstein Forum. My name is Misha Gabovic. I'm a staff member here and I'll be chairing the talk tonight. And here at the Einstein Forum, we don't subscribe to the German custom of prefacing talks with long and Baroque introductions, reading details of a speaker's institutional career and prizes of a piece of paper as if our audience was both illiterate and ill-informed. So I will simply say that Christopher Otter is Associate Professor of History at The Ohio State University and exactly the kind of unconventional thinker that we like to host at the Einstein Forum. He has a background in British and European history, in literature and literary theory, and in the history of science. And he likes to work on things that historians usually tend to avoid. One of those things is light. In 2008, he published a book t titled The Victorian Eye, a political history of light and vision in Britain, 1800 to 1910, which, so to speak, put him in the spotlight. For several years now, he has been working on food, and he has written on topics such as bovine history, the industrialization of food production, and especially the rise of the carbohydrate-rich diet. He is now writing, or has completed, a book titled The Vital State, Food Systems, Nutrition Transitions, and the Making of Industrial Britain. At the Einstein Forum, we often invite scholars to present and discuss a published piece of work, but we are even more keen on hearing about interesting work in progress or work that's just about to come out. And gosh, what an interesting topic this one is. As someone who has recently jumped on the low-carb bandwagon and generally holds strong but not always well-informed opinions about food and capitalism, I am greatly looking forward to Christopher's talk titled Diet for a Large Planet, the World Food System, Human Health and Ecological Overshoot. Please join me in welcoming Christopher Alter to the ISN Forum. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, and in between um, when I provided the information for this and now, the, the book is now called this. Uh, although the, the um, uh, post-colonic section is slightly different and includes a reference to Britain, which is what the book is largely about. Um, and we begin with, obviously, where I've drawn the title from, Francis Moller Pay's uh, Diet for a Small Planet, published in 1971, in which she wrote, what we eat ties us to the economic, political, and ecological order of our whole planet. And she begins this book by recounting her growing realization that the American diet rich um, in meat and refined carbohydrates, was inseparable from rising fossil fuel use, the mass importation of animal feeds, ecological degradation, and serious health problems. And she particularly uses these two sort of bodily and planetary health issues to sort of frame her argument. And heavy meat eating, she argues, particularly the grain-fed meat-centered diets was a historical aberration. Um, it was also incredibly and problematically cheap. It was pushing the earth beyond carrying capacity while leaving vast swathes of the planet to sink into a state of near permanent famine. Um, the consequences were global since America had helped to, quote, create a world of hamburger and wheat bread lovers. Um, and she urged people to eat, and I quote again, low on the food chain, touting the revolutionary potential of a plant-based diet. Now, her polemic um, is thin on historical details, but it's broadly correct. Almost all humans um, who have ever lived have eaten predominantly locally produced plant-based foods. The diet for a small planet is the historical norm, not the exception. So the question is, how did this change happen? Pre-modern megacities, places like Rome, early modern city-states, drew food from considerable distances, while elites have long feasted on excessive quantities of meat, um, refined wheat breads, and sugary delights. Um, but the generalized shift, the democratization of food um, coming from long distances in a refined and high-protein state, first took place in Northwest Europe. It was probably, you might argue, pioneered by the Dutch, um, but it really took over um, on a larger scale in Britain 
from the late 18th century onwards. And this talk explores the British diets for a large planet um, and follows the, these two consequences central to LAPE, the, um, the health issues and ecological issues. So let's begin with what British people eat. Um, it's not a nice place to start, and I apologize. Um, in the First World War, an agrarian interpretation published in 1989, Avner Offer um, scathingly refers to the white flour, the refined sugar, the processed fats and frozen meat, the cheap imported staples that have given Britain the worst dietary heritage in Europe. Ouch. But kind of right in many respects. What are the features of this British diet? Um, this is where it starts to get uncomfortably close to home for everyone. Um, wheat becomes the dominant grain, um, usually highly refined. Um, animal protein consumption rises substantially. There is a huge rise in the consumption of sugar. Um, there's a modest but significant rise in dairy, rise in dairy products. An uneven but demonstrable rise in overall calorific levels. These things are hard to, to get at historically, but I think we can, we can be on safe ground saying that the average calorific consumption of, of British people rises substantially. This is often known as the nutrition transition, and it's since become a global phenomenon, inseparable from developments. Anywhere going through economic quote-unquote development passes through some kind of nutrition transition, whether you're in Brazil or South Korea or Japan or Mexico. Okay. Um, what the British did was truly pioneer the mass outsourcing of food production. This was trailblazing an extreme. Um, it was undertaken um, against the concerns of Malthus, who wanted Britain to remain self-sufficient. This process, we might argue, begins with what we can call the internal outsourcing of first in Scotland with the Highland Clearances, then in Ireland, helped by the famine. I won't go into the famine, I'm happy to answer questions on it, but it's part of this sort of a process. Um, then it accelerates with the free trade policies from the 1840s, which provided the legal economic framework for the opening up of North American, Argentinian, and Australasian commodity frontiers for grain and livestock production. Now you might ask, well, why? Why outsource foods? There are several interwoven causes here. Uh, Britain had a significant empire, a large reach with its navy, so it had the capacity to control significant swathes of the planet's, planet's surface. It was industrializing. Agriculture was deemed to be of secondary importance. And people forgot about Malthus and started reading Ricardo instead. Um, and his ideas about comparative advantage, which projected a future where there would be a dynamic industrialized core and a series of peripheral uh, regions, agrarian regions, which would supply Britain with cheap imported staples um, and fuel its progress. This is world systems theory um, circa 1820. Um, let's have a look at just two of the elements of this diet in a little bit of detail. We'll begin with meat. It's often got this nebulous connection to Britishness. I don't want to really explore that, but it's important to note that that exists. But by the mid-19th century, there were concerns that Britain was undergoing something of a meat famine, um, that its domestic supply was incapable of keeping up with its industrializing urban populations. Now, there are many, many available paths here. You can simply um, go vegetarian, for example. Um, you can intensify domestic production of livestock. You can start eating horse meat, as they did in France and indeed in Germany. Um, none of these fitted British economic and cultural imperatives. The key was going overseas for supply. Unfortunately, livestock in the Americas weren't quite right for British tastes, and livestock in, the, in Australia was non-existent. So Britain started to export um, large numbers of prime livestock, particularly shorthorns, Herefords and Frisians, to globally improve herds across the world. Um, this is uh, an example from Argentina showing uh, the origins of, of livestock here. Um, this also includes Denmark, which began to supply 
almost all of Britain's bacon by the later 19th century, and this was established by effectively engineering new animals. Um, this, trust me, is a land race pig. Um, people weren't generally interested in the legs. Um, they're interested in the fat content. Um, same here with sheep. This is a Corridale sheep. Uh, this is a new breed engineered uh, by the British in New Zealand. Um, one piece of data here will suffice. In 1933, around 95% of world trade in mutton and lamb was British. I think the figure for, uh, for bacon is around 99%. So literally all lamb and bacon crossing international borders is going to Britain in the 1930s. Biological innovation here then produces newer and potentially better sources of meat. Um, this involved novel feeding regimen and ultimately fattening from birth, uh, truncating animals' lifespans and changing animals' shapes. Moving, a lot of the weight moves from the shoulders to the rear end of the animal. And also it's worth noting that um, fat uh, distribution changes. If we look at a piece of meat, from what I can tell from people in the audience, a lot of you don't like to look at pieces of meat, I apologise for this. Um, but if you notice the flecking of fat here, this is known as marbling. There is nothing quote-unquote natural about this. This is, a, this is a result of feeding regimen designed to disperse fat throughout the, the flesh from birth, rather than traditionally where there would be a huge layer of fat around the body of the animal as fattening was done towards the end of its life. Now, younger animals were more amenable to marbling, so there was this trend towards marble flesh, feeding from birth, uh, these particular regimes of, of uh, feeding, uh, feeding regimes from birth and uh, early slaughter. Technological innovation is also important. How do you get the meat from these various parts of the world? Um, at first, live animals are shipped across the Atlantic, um, this was a fairly brutal practice. There was a lot of onboard carnage, animals thrown overboard, animals escaping when they got to Britain. Um, but from the 1870s, we start to get reliable freezing and mechanical refrigeration technologies. This has been, there's been much uh, writing and literature on here, and the development of uh, the logistics of meat distribution in Britain, including the cold chain running right the way to the store. Okay, a little bit on wheat here. Um, during the 19th century, wheat became Britain's dominant grain. Um, oats and barley decline um, in terms of consumption. Various forms of oat cakes and porridge also decline. There's a lot of um, upsets in the Celtic fringe over this, but it certainly <laughs> happens. Britain remained largely self-sufficient in wheat until about 1850 when the opening of these giant grain frontiers uh, produces a sort of avalanche of cheap grain which floods the British market and forces a lot of British farmers to start growing something else or to go out of business almost entirely. But it's a real exemplar of Britain's free trade policies. In 1881, the liberal economist Robert Giffen stated that if overseas wheat was cheaper, then it seemed pointless for British farmers to grow it at all. Um, Britain developed the world's largest wheat deficit um, by 1908, around two-fifths of all wheat entering the global marketplace come to Britain. Um, around 80% of Britain's wheat is imported um, in 1914, so four-fifths of all loaves are effectively imported. Um, British domestic wheat, ac wheat acreage tumbles uh, dramatically, and there are even concerns about its extinction as a domestic crop. The world's most important wheat supplier becomes Canada, as a result of heavy state investment in things like railways and grain elevators and a very reliable inspection system. In 1923, Canada is producing around 53% of Britain's wheat imports. And the prairie landscape, it's worth noting as a prelude to the ecological part of this paper, becomes one of the world's most monocultural spaces. Um, there are some areas where wheat makes up about 90... Sorry, there's a picture of... Sarah Huckabee Sanders just appeared in the background, so putting me off. Um, in drier regions, wheat makes up about 90% of, of everything being grown. Um, wheat becomes one of the most important international commodities. It's pretty much a perfect commodity in the sense that it's durable, storable, compact, mobile, standardizable. Um, these inspection systems are tremendously successful, particularly in Canada. 
Um, telegraphs are conveying nearly instantaneous price information around the world, which means that price differentials drop. We can talk about a truly global marketplace. And then we have the rise of speculation and futures trading as well here. Um, but there's also an important biological innovation angle here too. Um, there's plenty of wheat grown in Britain, but it has fairly low gluten levels. And any of you who bake will know that wheat with a low gluten levels does not make a nice kind of fluffy bread loaf. As, as the population um, became used to the white wheat bread loaf, it was necessary to use hard uh, wheats with high gluten levels. And these grew very well in Russia, and they also grew extremely well in Canada and the United States. And we have the creation of new wheat breeds, notably Marquis. There's a phase in, in Canada where kids were being called Marquis. So, um, so important, so amazing. Um, the development of a roller milling in the 1870s allowed for the rapid production of extremely refined flours. So with, with roller milling, um, along with wheats like Marquis, we get the conditions of possibility of the things that British people like to eat. <laughs> And I'm not doing my national cuisine many favours here, but you all know what I mean. Um, now, the British nutrition transition then, just to summarise, um, massively rising consumption of meat, wheat, let's not forget sugar, that in some ways is even more um, dramatic. This involves exceptional levels of imports, drawing Britain into deep economic connections with various parts of the world, and these, these are very long-distance connections. Some of these places, particularly Argentina, Australasia, Canada, the connections are symbiotic. If anything goes wrong with Britain's economy, something's going to go wrong over there too. By 1914, 60% of the calorific value of food consumed in Britain comes from overseas. Um, this involves biological innovation. We've seen the pigs. We've seen um, the Marquis wheat. It's also worth noting there's a tremendous amount of biological innovation in Germany in the form of sugar beet, which is probably the most dramatically um, transformed food plant over the course of this history, centred um, around uh, Magdeburg. Um, Germany is the biggest supplier of, of sugar for Britain by the early 20th century. So the, these economic changes happen very quickly and involve biological um, change. Um, as Jason Moore argues, a, a book that in many ways I I, I have a sort of dialogue with in this book, um, a small, densely populated island in northwest Europe, industrialized by drawing the majority of its calories from commodity frontiers, as Jason Moore calls them. Um, and this is clearly a, a story of capitalism, but it's not just a story of capitalism, because the consequences and ripple effects can be felt at multiple scales. Um, some of them discussed in the, in the book um, include this biological control, the, the apparatus of animal slaughter on a giant scale, all kinds of public health issues from adulteration uh, through to emerging foodborne pathogens. Um, food security is, issues, particularly war, is transformed by this kind of food system. Um, and the global provisioning asymmetries which lead to famines on an epic and global scale. Um, but I'm going to follow Le Pay and not talk about these things here and talk about the body and planetary ecology. So let's begin with the body. And it's fair to say that in changing diet this radically, um, human beings were transformed in a, in a fairly elementary biological way. This diet is more refined, it's more concentrated, um, fiber strips and dehydrated. The idea of eating something small that's full of calories is historically extremely, like a chocolate bar or a packet of crisps. This is extremely historically unusual. Um, the food is highly seasoned. Um, it's not fresh, hence our obsession with freshness. It's materially heterogeneous in, 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 the, case, in the fact that sort of more food is produced in factories where things are sort of mingled together. Um, but it's also plentiful. So what happens to the body? This is an ambivalent story. This is not a story of unalloyed horror. Obviously, as historians, we usually focus on the negatives, and I will do. Um, I'm a sort of pessimistic person generally, so that's what I tend to do. But these positives are significant. First of all, there's improved resistance to opportunistic infections, and tuberculosis is significant here. It's almost certain that better diet made people more resistant to death by tuberculosis and serious illness caused by tuberculosis. 
Um, micronutrient deficiency declines in the 20th century with the um, discovery of vitamins. Now, more consequentially, over the arc of this history, if more calories are available, um, people start to get bigger. And human height increase, all things being equal, as a sign of improved nutrition. And the evidence is that after an initial 19th century dip, human heights rise. Um, there is more energy available for labor. Combined with better um, clothing and shelter, this improves human thermodynamic efficiency. It means people aren't losing so much energy to coals. According to Robert Fogel, this combination of increased um, calorie intake and increased um, thermal efficiency explains around 50% of British economic growth since 1790. In other words, this is the fuel powering the Industrial Revolution. It's not just steam engines. I'll get, this, is a, this is an economist who's controversial, so we can take issue with some of the figures, but it's clearly significant. Finally, and arguably most significant of all, despite the gender issues, which I'll go into briefly later in the talk, it's clear that rising calorific intake improves maternal health and then improves fetal health and infant health. And this is an autocatalytic cycle. So these are the good things. Um, what about the more problematic things? In um, Food and Health, 1925, two eminent British nutritionists, the Plimmers, um, Valerie Plimmer, but I forget what Mr. Plimmer was called, um, civilization has made it too easy um, for us to get the wrong kinds of all foods and difficult to get the foods we ought to eat. Natural foodstuffs form but part of the present day diet because they have for convenience been replayed by less perishable foods. This is a part of a wave of anxiety about the loss of the natural and its replacement with the synthetic in the early 20th century which manifested itself in many different ways. Today, we often refer to this notion of abandoning some sort of putatively natural diet um, as evolutionary mismatch theory. The idea here that the body, uh, as it's evolved, and the environment in which it now lives are somehow at odds and out of sync. This was first registered in often very hyperbolic, alarmist, degenerationist discourse. Uh, the sugary, starchy British diet was blamed, and I quote here, for the decay of man, the decay of his teeth, his arteries, his bowels, and his joints on a colossal, unprecedented scale. White bread and sugary cakes um, caused the expanding waistlines and the clogged bowels of what Alan Long called a nation of, and I quote again, constipated, toothless fatties. Um, use that. Well, next time you're in England and see <laughs> how far you get. Um, now, what about these constipated, toothless fatties? Um, transformed diet leaves its mark at every point on its journey through the body. Refined starches, sugars, and jam. The British were the jam makers of the world. They imported the sugar from Germany, and they used their own fruit trees uh, here, but they, it was like 50% sugar, um, the sugariest jam in the world. Uh, confectionery. Uh, increasingly blamed for the ruinous state of Britain's teeth. Uh, Harry Campbell, in a diatribe against the British teeth in 1936, states, the British have the worst teeth in the world. Their condition beggars description. It should excite in us a feeling of shame and humiliation, a fixed determination to mend our ways and remedy the evil. He claimed there were at least 100 million diseased teeth in Britain. The average British mouth contained, and I quote, a perfectly ghastly series of decaying fangs. Um, but this is not merely hyperbolic. If we study skeleton, skeletal evidence, it's quite clear that the increasing use of refined foods has generated historically greater levels of caries, certainly manifest in this period before the generalized use, using of toothpaste. And there was a lot of objection towards toothpaste and toothbrushes um, from these people. They want, they want a, a natural diet not toothbrushing, which is merely um, a sort of placing a kind of band-aid over the problem. The idea was sustained by studies. Um, there's some British teeth. Here's some more. Um, well, these are from um, northern Scotland. Um, comparing the bodies of those, these are sort of anthropological studies, comparing the bodies of those who 
who had gone through the nutrition transition to those who had not. And these constantly showed, and it, we see this kind of evidence today, although there are fewer and fewer people who have not gone through this, um, the dental problems associated with refined carbohydrates, um, the rise of appendicitis, a dyspepsia, diverticulitis, heart disease, diabetes. And this, I think, reaches its crescendo in what we might call the great constipation panic of the late 19th century. Um, the argument here was that constipation is the um, paradigmatic disease of civilization um, caused by sedentary habits, um, caused by corsets, caused by modesty, caused by bad toilets, and of course caused by white bread, um, the overburdened colon, and this is from John Harvey Kellogg, um, was a, quote, slow poison factory, or a cesspit, which eventually becomes kinked and twisted and sinks within the body. And the result, according to the Britain, British arch foe of costiveness, Arbuthnot Lane, was auto-intoxication, whereby this kind of accumulated, impacted fecal material begins to poison the body from within. According to Arbuthnot Lane, this spells the failure of civilization. It is a veritable Pandora's box out of which tumbled almost every ailment known to humanity, including cancer and shell shock. That's what was really going on in the trenches. Um, now, the cures here inclu included all manner of, of remedies. People began subjecting themselves to abdominal douches, um, to oxygen baths. Uh, rectal drills, massaging equipment, pills and suppositories. Don't try this at home. Um, ultimately to laxatives and the rise of wholemeal breads. Um, we, and there's, a, there's a, a continual war between the advocates of wholemeal bread and white bread, which has never really gone away. Um, Hovis uh, is developed in the 1880s. Uh, the panic culminated in a brief craze for colectomy, which for those of you who are not, don't know what that word means, is the removal of the colon, uh, surgically. Um, Lane was one of many individuals, including Mechnikov um, and Arthur Keith, the British, famous British anthropologist, who believed the colon was evolutionary vestigial. Um, we no longer needed it. Our diet had effectively rendered it useless. Um, and one British uh, medical editor grumbled that if this rage for colectomy continued, an intestine, an intestine of the natural length will before long be as rare as an appendix. I have a full colon, a sort of long colon. Uh, the craze obviously subsided. British people don't have their colons removed. Um, but we would be wrong to dismiss Lane as a crank. Um, because numerous doctors and psychologists were already positing enigmatic connections between the intestines and the mind. In 1912, Francis Brook of Guy's Hospital reported distinctive fecal flora and alimentary toxemia in neurasthenic patients. He postulated a direct causal relationship between the two phenomena, and he recommended dietary change. The world's first fecal transplant was undertaken in 1922, and a market in often dubious bacterial supplements developed. So um, to when one uh, of, of Germany's famous uh, international stars here, uh, Julia Enders, writes um, a gut and, and talks about the gut-brain axis, the second brain, as it's sometimes been called, um, there's a longer history to this. Um, and these connections between um, the health of the intestines and the health of the mind We've been discussing this for a good 120, 130 years. Um, more intractable concerns included rising rates of heart disease and diabetes, and also obesity. Um, numerous 19th century observers, including Americans um, visiting Britain, noted anecdotally that the British girth appeared to be increasing. And there's demonstrable data produced um, through insurance companies who became concerned about overweight um, people. There's a shift around 1880, 1890 from insurance companies being worried about overly thin people to being worried about overly obese um, individuals. This, is, this marks a democratization of obesity. Um, traditionally, 
something feasible only for the wealthy, who often flaunted it as a sort of form of corporeal uh, power. Obesity really begins to accelerate after 1945, um, when declining physical activity combined with post-war um, dietary abundance seriously unsettled British hormones um, and the complex signaling pathways governing appetite and fat storage. Um, the prevalence of serious obesity doubles in Britain between 1980 and 1991. Philip James, chairman of the International Obesity Task Force, uh, reported in 2004 that the rise of obesity in Britain is as fast or faster than anywhere else in the world. Well, obesity is rising everywhere, um, but we might ask why the Anglo countries, where this dietary transition originates, um, are most highly affected. The Anglo world, it seems to be, there seems to be something going on here. There's something a little bit extra uh, weight being carried. Now, one cause of this significant difference is probably socioeconomic, which gets, which gets us back to the economic principles upon which the transition um, took place. In the spirit level, uh, Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett, some of you may be familiar with this book, argue that stress um, plays a significant role in obesity by releasing cortisol and stimulating the consumption of sugary, um, floury comfort foods. The major, they, they postulate that stress is higher in more unequal societies, that once societies cross a certain wealth threshold, inequality is a good marker of stress. And inequality is greater in the United States, uh, Britain, and other parts of the Anglo world than it is in continental Europe. Um, and major social effects of stress include feelings of helplessness and subordination. And these are higher in these more individualistic countries. So the, the argument here is that the greater economic insecurity of the Anglo world countries are themselves contributing to stress and cortisol production. Um, which may even be transmitted in utero to the fetus. And in these countries, corporations have had freer play in reshaping the nutritional landscape. Um, therefore, sort of social protection against fast food and so forth is, is, is more difficult. Um, so these economic metabolic peculiarities perhaps explain the particular bodily history of Britain and the United States as again, against places uh, such as France um, and Italy. There's also an important gender dimension to this story. Um, the calorific benefits of the transition were asymmetrically distributed, with men invariably receiving um, larger quantities of food than women and certainly larger quantities of meat than women. Um, women tended, particularly poor women, to eat a diet that was far larger in far greater in empty calories, in sugar, sugary tea, um, margarine, white breads. Um, these are often precisely those foods that produce weight gain. Um, we know that the female body develops more subcutaneous fats during puberty, and that women often accumulate more weight than men. Now, in the later 19th and early 20th centuries, this, this dietary reconfiguration whereby women were eating fewer calories but more fattening calories coincided um, with powerful norms emphasizing female thinness and restraint in eating. Um, if you read things like Girls Own Paper, sponsored by Bourneville Coco, um, the, the, the sort of the norm here of a woman, of women who don't eat very much, who nibble in private, is, is kind of cemented. It's seen as being unladylike to, um, and many studies of anorexia and the history of anorexia have, have emphasized this. Now, there are many outcomes here. One of them is the overworked, exhausted um, working woman with a raft of minor ailments, from varicose veins to headaches. Um, but one of the most significant is the concomitant emergence of anorexia nervosa. Um, the British physician named the term, uh, sort of coined the term anorexia nervosa in 1874, meaning loss of appetite with a nervous origin, replacing the older uh, term anorexia hysteria. Um, small numbers of cases in the 19th century became an avalanche in the later 20th. 1.6 million people in Britain are currently listed as suffering from an eating disorder, a trend obviously amplified by digital media. What is clear is that nutritional change 
has not just had tremendous bodily changes, it's also led to changes in the self and the psyche. Um, a new traumatic and fraught relationship with food has been formed, of which anorexia nervosa is one dimension. So just to sum up this section, when we think about this as a, an almost a major event in the history of the human body, a time when diets changed quite dramatically, quite quickly, the effects are complex. They include the inc increasing height, strength, disease resistance, reduction in deficiency diseases, increase in male energy, but also the rising incidence of a whole range of diseases which can be called mismatch diseases. Dental disease, appendicitis, we haven't discussed allergies, and celiac disease, all of these things seem to have their emergence around 1900. Again, there's a, there are, these are complex questions. I didn't go into them here. And a massive increase in what, uh, in what is often called metabolic syndrome. This kind of derangement of metabolism, often manifest in heart disease, obesity, and diabetes. And there is also an increasingly psychologically complex relationship with food, of which anorexia nervosa is the most salient example, but there are many others. Okay, um, I want to shift gears now and talk about ecology and talk about um, what I've sometimes called the large planet philosophy. Um, there's this, I, in this idea of outsourcing large amount of British food production, there is an underlying premise which is challenged by Malthus, by Jevons, by numerous people, but this becomes hegemonic. Um, that we can keep on effectively mining the world for resources almost ad infinitum. There are no real planetary limits to na national development, or these such limits were sufficiently distant in time and space to hardly be worth worrying about. Now, as, I note, as, I, as I've noted, pretty much every country undergoing nutritional transition outsources food to some extent. That's, that's a commonplace. Um, if you look at like South Korea today, the amount of food being imported is, is astonishing. Um, but this, the centrality of outsourcing in the 19th century was central to Britain. If we look at Germany, for example, um, although German, Germany requires inputs from overseas, um, whether these be nitrates and phosphates or animal feeds, the, the Germans are still significantly more self-sufficient uh, with a greater investment in and commitment to intensified uh, domestic agriculture, I nearly said um, intestinized domestic <laughs> agriculture there, you forgive me that slip. <coughs> For Britain, by contrast, um, the vast empire and powerful navy creates the luxury of behaving as if growth was potentially unlimited and sustainable. The economist Robert Turnbull in 1903 calculated that everyday Britain needs, needs 1,000 more acres of additional land for its food, and that did not include um, meat. Um, this became political in 1906, uh, when the neo-protectionists led by Joseph Chamberlain attempted to, um, to frame a new policy of imperial preference and a new drive for self-sufficiency. The liberals hit back by basically saying, look, uh, your cheap bread, um, and this is very much sort of Jason Moore's argument, cheap food wins every time. And there are, there are many sort of examples of this. Who wants to eat black bread and horse meat, this repulsive, autarkic German diet? We have big loaves of cheap bread. So cheap food and the large planet philosophy um, triumphs. This meant voracious annexing and cultivation of what people like your Borgstrom and William Catton would later call ghost acreage or phantom carrying capacity. Um, one recent um, study of uh, socio-ecological transition by Shandl and Kaussmann says this British model of planetary outsourcing, and they sort of very sort of pithily and soberly understate this, not a sustainable and generally applicable blueprint for European industrialization. Um, end quote. Um, the British, uh, by combining economic takeoff with prodigious fossil fuel use, desire for meat, wheat, and sugar, and the territorial territorialization of vast swathes of non-contiguous planetary surface area, the large planet philosophy, um, pioneered ec ecological overshoots. 
um, which at a global level, um, uh, the reproduction of ecological overshoot by many nations is the reason we're in the ecological predicament we are. Um, if we look at something as um, iconically national um, as a full, uh, sorry, um, or uh, no apologies at all. Um, the, the full English breakfast, it's worth pointing out, it is, it is a planetary breakfast. It's, it's sourced from uh, various parts of the world, the bacon from Denmark, the sausage from God knows where, um, the wheat from Canada, the eggs for a long time from places like Russia, although British egg production uh, peaked uh, thereafter, the tea uh, from India, the sugar from Germany or from the Caribbean, and, and we could go on there. The liquid milk, we could guarantee, was uh, English um, and probably the mushrooms. Um, so the English breakfast is a planetary breakfast and it, and it basically embeds this um, system of ecological overshoot in national icons. Um, the entire arc of British uh, growth uh, was built on the premise, uh, consciously or otherwise, that it was Britain's right to seriously exceed carrying capacity, and this made economic and, dare I say, gustatory sense. Um, it was built on the thermodynamically implausible premise that economics and ecology were completely materially unconnected. As Kenneth Boulding grumbled, um, um, economists and, and British economists, uh, premier among them, have failed to come to grips with the ultimate consequences of the transition from the open to the closed earth, or the shift from the large to the small planet philosophy. And as the rest of the world began developing, the idea that carrying capacity could be indefinitely increased came to appear uh, increasingly implausible, uh, with Paul Ehrlich, admittedly uh, uh, something of a scaremonger, uh, saying that if everyone con consumes like a contemporary American, we need five Earths, Catton said ten. Uh, but the ultimate consequence of this diet is that we begin to see the limits of the Earth and either try to um, eat for a small planet or decide that space farming is the future. And I can take questions on space farming if you want, uh, not that I'm an advocate. In, now let's just sum up some of the details of how this plays out in practice. And I just talk about four or five ecological dimensions here. Um, in the early 19th century, um, European agriculture was still, um, still relied upon the legume manure agricultural system that dates back centuries. Um, but this was coming under strain, and what followed was a ceaseless quest to secure sufficient nitrate and phosphate inputs into agriculture at home and overseas. This involves the use of industrial byproducts, superphosphates, domestic coprolites, which had mined out pretty quickly in Britain by the 1850s, Peruvian guano mining, um, Chilean nitrates, before the ultimate triumph of the invention of synthetic nitrates, the great German invention uh, of Fritz Haber, and the most important large planet technology ever created, and this of course comes out of Germany's drive for self-sufficiency um, and, and an awareness um, that it's, it's going to have to rely upon um, its own in scientific ingenuity. Um, humans had temporarily but spectacularly escaped the limits of the natural nitrogen cycle, and agriculture was catapulted in, in what Lamer in the world fertilizer economy called the fertilizer epoch. Um, that one hasn't uh, sort of stuck with historians, but I think it's kind of significant for this. Now, if we begin to um, look at what Britain does, it basically completely cakes its colonies and its commodity frontiers in synthetic fertilizer. Um, uh, the, the rate of anthrop anthropogenic nitrate uh, creation rose about tenfold between 1860 and 2000. What happens here is that ni the nitrogen cycle becomes what um, some scientists have called a nitrogen spiral. We get the accumulation of excess nitrates in aquatic and atmospheric reservoirs, along with nitrogen emission, uh, emissions from power plants and cars. This causes eutrophication and acidification. The accumulation in tropospheric ozone, uh, of, of tropospheric ozone and greenhouse gases. And if we look at this uh, admittedly simplified uh, version of the nine planetary boundaries, uh, the, the crossing of which indicates irreversible ecological damage. Um, we can see that the, uh, the nitrogen and phosphorus boundaries are two of the critical ones that we've crossed. And this 
tie, this, this indicates the closeness of this history of food and food systems to the emergence of the Anthropocene and, and all the concerns that go along with this. Two other interlinked um, phenomena here are deforestation and soil erosion. Um, if we look at a place like New Zealand, its, its ecology was completely transformed within 40 or 50 years of Britain taking over. Um, grasslands rapidly replaced forests. The British are importing their own, their own pasture grasses, uh, creating anthromic artificial pasture types to go along with those nice Corridale <coughs> sheep. Um, about 85% of New Zealand's original wetlands are destroyed very, very rapidly, and, and uh, Stapledon, um, the famous British uh, agrarian economist or uh, scientist, stated that there have been vast changes wrought in habitat relations in Australasia with swords almost wholly British in character. And this is about as far from Britain as you can possibly get. You're sort of recreating uh, another Britain to supply food, which only goes to Britain via the vastest possible planetary difference. I can also talk here about soil erosion. The Dust Bowl was not just an American event. I'm sure many of you are aware of that. It's a global event erupting across all these commodity frontiers in the 1930s, from Canada uh, to South Africa, where it was seen as being a, a, a dreadful problem, um, to Australia. Um, and this is largely as a, a result of reckless soil mining, uh, of just of not replacing nutrients, of not practicing rotation, of simply farming at a kind of industrial uh, level here. Um, you see sort of in the, these images here the sort of accumulation of, of, um, of earth after one of these dust storms. Um, in their tirade against um, soil erosion, uh, published in 1939, Vanishing Lands, Jackson White uh, argued that in much of the New World, profit and wealth, I quote, have been most easily won by exploiting and exhausting virgin soils. And um, in his Road to Survival, uh, William Vogt uh, described Britain thus as a contented parasite, drawing on the eroding hillsides of New England, of Iowa or Maryland, Argentina, South Africa, of Australia, India, the famous steaks and chops at Simpsons, carried with them the nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, and other soil minerals from half the world. Um, this idea that eating high on the food chain is transforming global ecology in, in, a, in a way which is producing sort of cascading ecological effects. Um, these were increasingly uh, manifest through the fossil fuel inputs that crop up across the world food system in the 1930s, 40s, 50s. Um, this knits Britain's food system together. It, it is the cause of the great speed at which food can be brought. Um, it's worth noting the average distance traversed by uh, London's imported food was around 1,800 miles in the 1830s. It was nearly 6,000 miles by 1910. Studies of Paris show much, much lower levels. That Paris remains much tight, more tightly connected to its agrarian hinterland than London does. By 2002, uh, London's ecological footprint is double the UK's size. So these, these have long, long histories to them. Now if we go back to our, um, this Anthropocene thing, the genetic diversity, um, sometimes manifest in the sixth extinction, is perhaps the one that gets the most press. And I just want to sort of tie this into our discussion uh, here. Um, these reconfigured commodity frontiers um, were, as you've seen in the case of Canada, controlled ecosystems with homogenized plant communities and reduced biodiversity. What you see here is biomass being concentrated in small numbers of genetically similar organisms farmed in vast, vast quantities, Marquis wheat, landrace pigs. Um, these simplified ecosystems need protecting because they lose their capacity to self-regulate. They become much more vulnerable to viruses and fungal infections. They have higher densities of insect pests. And so monocultures became saturated with an increasing uh, range of pesticides. It's a very similar story with, with animals, where today um, livestock zoo mass dwarfs wild zoo mass. Uh, around, there's around 10 times uh, the amount of domestic animal if you piled them all together and made cubes. Um, it's 10 times the size 
the domestic animals than for wild ones. Um, and vast swathes of the Earth's surface have been cleared to accommodate these animals, but not just any breeds. Now, uh, we've talked earlier on about creating breeds. These breeds were created and discarded at an extremely fast rate. Um, Darwin notes this in The Origin of Species when he describes, and I quote, the process of extermination among our domestic cattle, noting how the ancient black cattle of Yorkshire were displaced by longhorns, and then he notes these have been replaced by shorthorns, and since Darwin wrote, the shorthorn has been largely replaced too. This became fairly redundant fairly quickly. Um, if we look at British domestic pigs, here are some British domestic pigs, some of which don't exist anymore. Um, the large white Ulster pig, for example, uh, which was created to create bacon for the British market, to rival that from Denmark, but didn't really succeed, was extinct by the 1960s. So we have this coming into being an extinction of breeds at a very, very fast rate. There are many cattle breeds, the Irish Dun, the Suffolk Dun, the Alderney, that have gone extinct. And those breeds which do dominate, um, such as Holsteins, uh, such as um, Herefords, uh, such as Landrace, these have themselves have reduced gene pools as a consequence of artificial um, insemination, whereby a single bull can impregnate many, many cows and produce genetically fairly homogeneous offspring. This is called a reduction in effective population size. So just to sum up this section, um, there are a whole series of interwoven ecological effects which we find cropping up in discussions of, of the Anthropocene here, soil erosion, fossil fuels, food miles, and so forth. Um, a brief aside here, we should not assume that these large planet chaps had it their own way. Um, there was plenty of rebellion. Um, the vegetarian movement, as we understand it, uh, perhaps can be dated to the 1830s in Manchester, the home of the Industrial uh, Revolution. Um, organic farming um, took off in both Germany and Britain in the interwar period. Um, the politics were equally right-wing for, for both. Uh, interestingly enough, you sort of be reading his book on organic farming in, in Britain, suddenly there'll be all sorts of fascistic statements in there, then we, they'll be back to farming again. Um, so there's critique from the very start, but I'm not going to talk about the critique here. I'm happy to take questions on it. What I want to do now is just offer something of a conclusion. Um, and I'm going to return to the British diet. This is what British people eat. You've seen them walking around, chocolate bars, litter. Now, although the British diet has often been the subject of international ridicule, um, the system which produced and sustained it and the foodstuffs it supplied uh, have been historically enormously consequential. I hope at least I've convinced some of you of, of this. Um, if we look at La Paix's Diet for a Small Planet, published in 1971, She's attacking the American food system, and, and viewed from the vantage point of 1971, this seems logical. Um, in the post-war period, the United States became the center of the world food system, um, not least um, through its capacity to use its giant grain surpluses as geostrategic tools. And the American diet does appear to spread wherever there is, quote, development or freedom, even though Le Pay uh, saw it as exactly the opposite. Um, and today it's commonplace viewing on a very large scale for us to look at these Americanized phenomena of the world economy and world ecology as part of something called the Great Acceleration, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with. This this idea post-1945 that every single measure of, hum of human use of resources suddenly rises exponentially. You can see this is, the, this, is the, um, this is sometimes called the Anthropocene Control Panel, showing all these various graphs. I mean, you, you get the point. Everything since 1945 is, is, uh, is teetering uh, upwards here. Uh, and food is integral to this. Um, during the Great Acceleration Period, post-1945 onwards, there have been three world food crises post-World War II, the early 1970s, and the seemingly rolling crisis which began in the 2000s, which has been manifest in a whole wave of interlinked phenomenon from biofuel use to volatile food prices, spiking food prices, a fear that the end of cheap food is over, um, droughts, electronic speculation, 
um, and a world increasingly bifurcated into stuffed and starved, um, with the developing world being the most um, vulnerable. There's a tendency to conflate the Great Acceleration with the Anthropocene and with everything that's, that's um, interesting and dangerous um, in history. But um, I, I think that our, our eyes are too often drawn to this post-1945 period without looking at the longer period before it where a significant amount of momentum was built up and systems were put in place which have since exploded. Between 1850 and 1939, Britain absolutely dominated uh, world trade in foods. Um, and it built a huge world food system to support itself. Um, and it made wheat, meat, and sugar um, the sort of triad of developmental um, nutrition. This became a, center, a central motor of the global economy. It was increasingly driven by fossil fuels and synthetic fertilizers. This nutritional change was inseparable from epidemiological transition, population growth, new patterns of morbidity and mortality. And in many ways, um, we haven't crossed any threshold into something catastrophically new. What we're merely witnessing, merely is probably the wrong word there, is a scaled up an accelerated version um, of what the food system did to the world in the period 1750 to 1950. And I'll conclude there. Thank you very much. Do you want me to sit? Thanks a lot. That's, that's a lot to digest. So, questions, That's a good joke, comments. though. I'm just going to get it. interesting ones, but the first thing that occurred to me at the beginning and the end of your lecture um, calls into question the idea that the British diet is the worst, because I have noticed um, a strong and surprising trend in Britain. I'm not there that often, but I'm, um, I'm certainly there often enough to notice. Um, that, for example, you can get better, healthier food in Heathrow than in most airports in Europe or, or the U.S. And it seems like, and also, you know, on the street, there's, there's relatively affordable, at least compared to what it used to be. And I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about the changes, if they've occurred, or um, am I seeing something, am, am I seeing a change that isn't really happening? First of all, there's a distinct, is that what's ridiculed um, historically as British cuisine, um, and this is a book that's not really about cuisine, it's about raw materials. Those raw materials, it's the same raw materials that are being used all over the place. There are just people in different <coughs> countries who historically have, have devoted more time and care to cooking them than, than the British did. Now what, so that's one aspect here. So the, 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 in terms of the quantity of food coming into Britain, that was, that was by and large a good thing for, hu for human health. In terms of what you're talking about now, there have been tremendous changes since 1945 uh, in, in terms of, I think what happens is that, that, that there's a whole <coughs> series of trends introducing, so for example, people started eating more chicken, they started eating more yogurt, they started eat, eating more fruit. That kind of bog standard basic diet still kind of persists but it, it's increasingly opposed by a diet that's seeking to, seeking to escape from it at every possible turn mm -hmm. and to become cosmopolitan and to diversify. That said, the food you're getting still includes a lot of wheat, a lot of sugar and a lot of dairy, even if it's being cooked differently. So there's a sort of the, the distinction between cuisine and diet and a series of shifts in the post-1945 diet that are important. But it, it seems like it's seriously less meat, for example, and um, and not since forty five, but more mm. like since ninety five right. or two thousand. Well, there's several ways in which it's changed since nineteen forty five, and um, certainly there's been accelerated changes with the sort of globalization of cuisine since since even the nineties. Um, that said, British people still eat a lot of meat. Um, 
that there's just more vegetarian food there if you want it. Um, so, I mean, still historically, if everyone globally ate the level of meat that British people did, we'd be in even worse ecological trouble than we are. So it can probably, some, it just, I think that this cornucopian abundance and diversity can sometimes occlude the, the continuity that's, that's still there. Thank you so much for your talk, and you've brought together so many issues in a helpful and harrowing way that I really um, appreciate it. But I wonder um, if you could say a little bit about how labor in, enters the picture, um, the, you know, in terms of big agriculture and, and what the trends are now. Sure, yeah, I mean, in terms of, in terms of labor, one of the, the most important things here is that what the British did here was they established agriculture in places which, were, which were often um, had little, uh, where the state wasn't particularly powerful, or sometimes was non-existent, um, where the reach of the law was often um, ineffective, and therefore exploitation of labor on the commodity frontiers is astonishing and shocking. I showed you images of, of guano mining. Um, the nitrate boom in Chile has some of the most appalling labor conditions you'll ever come across. These are very often, with the collapse of, uh, of slavery within the British Empire, you now get this, all this sort of movement of indentured labor, often from India, around the world, from, from place to place. So across the commodity frontiers, labor conditions are appalling. Um, there is the destruction of First Peoples here as well, and the forcing of, you know, sort of, you know, gaucho culture being destroyed in, in Argentina. In Britain itself, agricultural labor remains, you know, the most poorly paid, or arguably the most poorly paid um, sector of the British economy. Um, global abattoir work becomes, you know, among the most um, harrowing jobs. So the labor history here is, is an unpleasant one. And, and by outsourcing anything, you evade your, the, the reach of your law. As, as Britain is developing this apparatus of labor laws in the 19th century, this is increasingly not applying to how its food's produced. So there's a huge outcry, for example, over the conditions of, of bakeries. Um, the, the, Bakers would work sort of 18 hour days. There are these appalling sort of Dickensian descriptions of bakeries and this becomes a kind of scandal. And so the law slowly clamps down upon conditions in bakeries and conditions for bakers improve. Um, but conditions on, in, the, in Canadian prairies, for example, are pretty tough. And those are not regulated at all by Britain. Now, places like Canada, there, there are sort of, there is, you know, the extent of the law does move across into the prairies, but the labor issue by outsourcing, you evade a lot of your own laws. That's, that. That's probably a sim simple way of putting it. Thanks, Chris. So the, the infrastructure for this democratization of, of meat and all these things is imperial. And this, these processes happen also in the kind of in-between regions um, a little later, but they happen uh, in, uh, even in India, kind of vegetarian India, and, and in the in-between places in the Middle East, mm -hmm. uh, lower classes take to meat consumption. Um, so um, would you care to comment on the imperial kind of uh, percolation of these uh, models of the body and the diet and the uh, uh, mismatches or the ill-fittings between um, the, the kind of uh, science that is tailored to a particular white European body mm -hmm. and, and the ways that other bodies are not perfectly kind of in sync with that. It's a good question. Um, one place, a good way into that question is to look at, um, at famine. Um, when, as I'm sure, most people here know that South Asia undergoes wave after wave of famine in the 19th century as a result of climate, but also a result of its kind of the shock effects of being absorbed into the world economy. Um, 
it, it's already part of the world economy, but it's it's even more part of the world economy as a result of, of the British here. And so, the feeding of famine victims becomes a major question. Now, Mike Davis writes this book, Late Victorian Holocaust. I'm sure many of you have read it. Um, where he basically accuses this as, of being a grand, you know, terrible colonial conspiracy. Um, but the evidence seems to suggest he's, he's onto something here, that there was a genuine belief that the body of the South Asian labourer required less protein, almost evolutionarily, as a result of, of living a, a vegetarian life. Um, there were, so when the South Asian um, dietaries were formed, even you know, ideas in Bengal before the famines, the premise was that the Indian labourer needs less meat and needs less food overall. These people are smaller and they need less protein. This is the, the, and so when famine rations are being justified, they're being justified by saying that there is no universal body here. There is a specific Indian body and it needs less food. And funnily enough, even some Indian economists use this. Um, so Radhamal Mukherjee, in the 1940s says, look, Indian people, they need less food. So move them around the world. You don't have to feed them so much. We should, we should, we should colonize the world and be the world's labor force because we have, we're incredibly efficient at processing food. So these racialized distinctions are certainly form. There is, there is yet a universal body. Um, it, the universal body can be brought into play at various points if the British desire that. But they're quite happy to, to argue that, no, we have the best diet in the world in terms of its nutrients, apart from Americans, who in American books at the same time were always like, we need 500 more calories. Honestly, just like we need to use 10 times as much water per day. Um, so these things are sort of built into the American books at the time. So that's one of your questions on. Was there a second question folded into that? Or does that suffice? Yeah, no, that's good. Um... But, but, but uh, obviously, you know, the Anglo world in terms of uh, numbers is not uh, mm -hmm. is, is less significant. Uh, sure. But, but this model is actually percolating and, and, and is seen as this kind of uh, model for imitation. Yeah, and it's interesting is if you look at sort of developmental economics and nutrition science, um, like the World Food Institute, people like Merrill Bennett, writing in the 40s and 50s, um, they're already as part of development, developmental theory, they've already got this nutritional aspect that they, everybody in the world gravitates towards this diet if they get wealthy. Um, they don't do it automatically, though. They, they do it because of the, these structures. And as you mentioned, the, sort of the, word, the word percolating, that percolation is happening through, um, through the implantation of economic systems, infrastructures, advertising, literature, there are, there are many, many ways in which that percolation happens. And the percolation is really, on a, on a large scale, a post-1945 model. And the percolation, the Americans deliberately, really deliberately do some percolating. If you look at the Korean diet, the South Korean diet undergoes a, a radical shift towards wheat. Um, and in, you know, Americans are sort of offloading cheap wheat to a country that doesn't traditionally grow much wheat. Um, they like wheat, they eat it. Uh, it distinguishes them from North Korea uh, in the many, many ways in which the diets can be distinguished. Um, that's not percolation as much as uh, as was very deliberate and calculated dietary transition, uh, which the Americans did more ostentatiously. They had more global reach. But the tendency is, I think, for us to see this is the, the whole story. There's a whole series of books on world food systems that focus on post-1945 that have a paragraph on the 19th century which is largely about Britain and, well, this was kind of starting. And so this book I've written is an attempt to kind of fill that gap and to, to say it's, it, it shouldn't just be passed over in a paragraph. So. I have a few questions on one of your central terms, the carrying capacity. Mm -hmm. um, Let's stay with Britain for a while on the era you, you were focusing on. Um, it seems that if sizable parts of the planet have not gone, undergone nutritional transition, it isn't much of a problem as long as you have free trade conditions to actually operate that way to exceed your carrying capacity, unless there's war. So my question would be, 
what were the precautions taken? Because that's a situation of extreme vulnerability if you depend as heavily on imports as that. Mm -hmm. That would be one. Um, the second one would concern Brexit in the sense that um, how much does food and food prices and quality play a role in the debates about Brexit? <laughs> and the third one, now I come to planetary carrying capacity. You invited us, I'm curious. Your position on space farming. Okay. <laughs> I love space farming. Um, so, war, in some ways the, the, the Napoleonic Wars, at the, at the start of the period we're talking about here, um, catalyzed an awful lot of discussion about food vulnerability, the con Napoleon's continental system. This is precisely when Malthus is writing, and this is precisely when some of the biggest debates in the political economy about self-sufficiency are being fought. But war really only becomes a large-scale concern for the British in the 1890s when there is much discussion about a world moving towards war and a big war and some people start ringing alarm bells and saying okay we need to become self-sufficient and and this largely comes from tories it's raised in parliament and there's a huge parliamentary com uh, commission held between 1903 and 1905 a royal commission on the production of food supplies in, t in times of war and, what the, and, and all c kinds of people crawl out of the woodwork and come up with grand schemes for ludicrous silos, fortified granaries, um, various other technologies filled with gases designed to last forever. Um, and, there's, and none of these things are put into practice. And in the end, the commission rejects all of them and says, you know, if there's a war, we'll just win because of our navy. And this is what Offa calls the Atlantic orientation. It says, in fact, in, instead of funding big silos, um, we will fund our navy in, instead and keep flows going. So there's, there's a lot of concern, a lot of anxiety. What does happen in both world wars is the British completely abandon um, this I idea of economic liberalism and they, they, they immediately begin state control of all aspects. They, they kind of fumble towards it in World War I, they do it immediately in World War II. State control of everything to do with food. And, and through that, what the British are also able to do is to use this system to blockade Germany and they kill about a million people in, in the process. There are similar developments in the interwar period, but the, exactly the same results that Britain goes into World War II without stockpiles. And although it does have a, a series of, of dumps where it deposits um, stores of, uh, of food around the British coastline and so on, there's all kinds of covert schemes there. But it's really only in the 60s, 70s and 80s that self-sufficiency kind of starts returning. The entrance into the EU helps this. So that, that perhaps is a Brexit. So the, e, the entrance into the EU and its various strictures does because the EU has its certain sort of autarkic proclivities, and these are interwoven with, uh, and so Britain becomes self-sufficient in wheat again, um, oddly enough, because now you can, st because of, there are various technologies of, which mean you can produce white bread from, even from, you can produce fluffy white bread even from British wheat by putting it in a machine and firing loads of chemicals at it. And you basically <laughs> produce a mother's pride loaf. So as for Brexit, um, I've tried to avoid Brexit, um, thinking about Brexit. I'm too busy worrying about Trump. Um, <laughs> but I do know that European, di that the, the idea that Brussels was determining like sausage shape, for example, um, would fill the pages of the Daily Mail. You know, that we, we have to have like, you know, s square sausages or whatever. Uh, these kinds of myths that our food autonomy was being taken away from us. But of course, we never had it because it was globally outsourced in the first place. As for space farming, um, I don't know if, do, is there any, do people practice, are starting to practice vertical farming in, in Germany? So vertical farming is, ta is taking off. The guy who writes um, the, 
the, the main book on vertical farming, um, it, it's a completely insane book. It's, it's really, it's genuinely, we do not need Earth anymore. We, Earth is bad, we can survive without it. Um, so these systems, the Russians started using them on spaceships to start growing. Someone grew a courgette in space. Um, there's a lot of, of um, there, there's a large amount of scientific literature now on the possibilities of terraforming um, Mars and using Mars to, to grow stuff. So we can grow lettuces and courgettes in space. And I heard something on the radio in the US the other day, it was a bunch of kids doing something with NASA. They're basically saying, you know, we've kind of fucked this planet up, so we're gonna have to start again. So we're gonna have to start farming um, elsewhere. So that's disturbing, to say the least. So, sorry. <laughs> Professor Otter, thank you. Carl Gross, I have one minor question and one major question. The minor question is, does Trump have anything to do with any further developments that you see beyond 2000? And the real question, though, is what happens with China? How does China influence mm -hmm. this, uh, in your view? I can only imagine that it gets more horrifying. <laughs> Okay, um, Trump, the only thing I'll say about Trump is that he embodies the diet for a large planet. Um, he embodies the diet for a large planet in bed with his cheeseburger and a milkshake watching telly. That's the kind of, that's the epitome of that graph is like Trump at the top of it. he lies about his height, so that his, uh... He's grown during the presidency, he's grown an inch apparently. So. <laughs> right, so that is great. So that he's still by 29.9. Great. Um, as for China, obviously the story here is how um, one country going through this transition and outsourcing is ecologically, brings problems. When everybody does this, it's impossible. Obviously, there are some countries, the United States, that can do this without outsourcing, although America imports tons of stuff, obviously, as, as well. What's happening in China um, is obviously this taken to a, a, an unimaginable scale. I mean, the transformation, I mean, pig farming is probably the best example. Um, the, I think like 50% of the world's pigs are now based in China in these kinds of facilities that boggle the mind to look at the sheer scale. So well, I've got like quite a lot of good material on, on pig farming in, in Britain in the post, in the early post-1945 period when, when pig farming really started to take off again in the UK. And they almost look quaint by comparison, even though they're absolutely horrifying sort of structures for entirely enclosing and enfolding animals within a technological system. So, so animal is basically conceived and lives entirely surrounded by technology. That in China now is, is, is taken to a scale that is difficult to imagine. I've not visited China. I don't know precisely um, what's going on with that, but the ecological effects of pig farming in China are all of these issues with, with nit cascading nitrogen and so forth. Nit China's, I think, by far the biggest user of, of synthetic fertilizer in, in the world. Um, so these issues are magnified there. But the issues are issues of scale. And one of the things I'm trying to think about in this book is how you think about scale historically, is how Britain kind of scales up. But in the post-1945 period, we, we've scaled up again and there are certain problematics that are, that are emergent there. But the Chinese story is yet to be fully told, so. Dominic? Uh, I have kind of a, I guess sort of a speculative question. It may not be your area of expertise, but I wonder if you have a, um, can have some ideas about it. Um, so one of, uh, the ironies today, right, is that it's the 
people among us who are most well off, who are turning toward low carb, <laughs> low meat, uh, locally sourced foods, which of course carry a price premium. Um, the question is, um, what would a second nutritional transition backwards, as it were, right. toward locally sourced diet from low in the food chain look like when you think about an entire population of a country? Mm -hmm. I mean, is it, even is it even conceivable that it's calorifically sustainable right. uh, or affordable for all classes of the population to eat that way, or would it require such a radical transition in the society itself that, I mean, the whole economic system would have to be reimagined some way, or <clears throat> are there ways going forward, I guess, or backwards, as it were? That's a bloody hard question. <laughs> I mean, the... If we're to un, to sort of deconstruct this, to dismantle it, um, population becomes a problem. If I mean, as Václav Schmil argues that, I mean, if all the Earth's population over three billion is sustained by synthetic nitrogen, then if we remove that from the equation, because that comes, that's largely produced through nat natural gases, essential for it, or you can use for other fossil fuels too. So if you dismantle that, then, um, although there are people who argue that techniques of permaculture um, can feasibly do it, I'm not an expert in permaculture technology, so I, I simply couldn't comment on that. We do have obviously a lot of manure from the amount of animals we produce, but that's reaching a point of profound unsustainability. If you go to a totally locally sourced diet, there are people who've argued that we can't, you can't have a vegan planet, for example, because um, oils become a real problem. If we, you know, if you live in Britain, you can't locally produce olive oil. I mean, maybe actually you can fairly soon, given the temperature change. Um, so, I mean, the most obvious fats to eat are, are, are butter and, and lard. So, I mean, maybe it, you would have to just eat what, what is available. Um, humans adapt to, pretty well to um, what's around them. So, I don't, I don't know, but I don't think the problem is a, is a real Very bad. So I understand that your project was centered uh, on the history from kind of the British perspective, um, mm -hmm. the role that Britain played, but uh, I want to question your comment that the motor change. Yeah, globalization, everything, it's just west, just the global south. Right. about China? Right, right, right. Yeah. right. Um, no, that's a good question, and, and, and these are issues that I'm, I'm still kind of pondering as I, as I go forward with this. Um, certainly, the period during which I'm writing, and I'm focusing particularly sort of on the 19th century, 
was a, a, a period when this nutritional transition was centered on a particular part of the world. As we now know, you know the, the world history viewed over a very long scale has parts of the world changed than others. So the period of the world is this system. What I'm saying is that there was this period when it, when it was food power it, it is, it is today. and structure aspirational that it put in early period of momentum. The question of you probably overly simplistic. Entry into date than I perhaps should. So that's, I hope that's at least gone some way towards answering your question. So you're half satisfied at least. Was mentioning of those people who are. something there are aims defined by United Nations and it would be interesting to see uh, what, what is because, because these questions are too much in nevertheless with other nations a lot of these declarations they are agreements and what happens in practice. That 
question. Um, the there are um, bodies for active in the early gets heavily food issues in the juices which play intention here is to is to somehow manage to control the world food system and avoid the kinds of catastrophic famines that one had seen at the end at the, the end of the, one of the central figures in in found The British, in particular, were vehemently opposed to this because they thought this would lead to inflation, inflated food prices. And their entire system, they were cheap food for their to go ahead. The whole thing, and what moves to Rome, um, was a body that was substantially, which was embodied with far less power than some people had initially envisaged it as having. And I think that also that is kind of which ends, that there, there Not a real strong, uh, stronger internal governance. Right. Yeah, and this doesn't happen. But we have sustainable development mm. that was agreed upon. That is what I mean. Which also would be involved uh, in your topics, uh, of course. Yeah, and that is that uh, more complexity that comes together where two very large uh, nationally uh, world that is right. pounded by all kinds of other agencies that are, have been heavily involved. shifts in the world whether the country is the self British model wants to kind of implant governance wherever it's coming from with regard to the food system. 